Hi, Kirk DiGiorgio here, presenting another short video for Sonic Academy. And this time I'm going to tackle the contentious issue of do we need to worry about game staging in the era of 32-bit floating point DAWs? I'll go for a brief explanation of what 32-bit floating point means. I'm not sure I understand all of it myself actually, but I'll do my best. And then I'll go on to some practical examples using Ableton Live and show you how 32-bit floating point files differ from 24-bit fixed files. And I'll also be explaining why I think it's still worthwhile to learn about game staging. So I hope you enjoy this short video. This is Kirk DiGiorgio for Sonic Academy. Don't worry, I'm not going to go into the maths or physics of 32-bit floating point processing. I don't understand it myself anyway. All I need to say is that there's two basic concepts to get into your head, dynamic range and signal resolution. Dynamic range is the quietest part of your music compared to the loudest part of your music. The dynamic range gets better the more bits you have. It's pretty simple really. 16-bit, that's CDs, you know, sounded fairly good for decades. They got about 96 dB of dynamic range. Your 24-bit interfaces, which we've been using for decades now, they'll have about 144 dB of dynamic range. Most microphones, vintage ones, nice ones, don't even come anywhere near that kind of dynamic range. So again, you're limited by that, but they sound perfectly good. 24-bit sounds great. Those are your fixed integer bit rates then we go on to floating point which isn't fixed and it does something very clever computationally that enables you to have the dynamic range from the quietest to the loudest of sounds that are impossible to create on this planet they would actually kill you the dynamic range i think 1500 db you know even if you're standing next to a super volcano it wouldn't get anywhere near that loud so we really are on the limits of audio here it's very clever stuff but you don't need to understand it all you need to know what's the benefit of that well it enables you to record incredibly quiet pieces of music and then you can raise the gain afterwards in really quiet passages and none of the noise floor comes up because the devices are such good resolution that they don't bring up any noise and that's absolutely fantastic for recording incredibly dynamic pieces of music like classical. The other factor is signal resolution and it's easier to visualize this you imagine that you've got a skyscraper with 16 bit you've got a fixed amount of floors each one representing a level of music with 24 bit you can fit in more floors because the resolution improves and you can chop your audio up into even smaller pieces and when it comes to 32-bit floating point this just goes into the stratosphere being able to reproduce minute layers of audio will improve quiet signals like the fading of a reverb tail for example obviously if you're only capable of reproducing a fixed amount of audio levels it's going to become a lot smoother if you go up to 32-bit imagine it like the dynamic layers that you get in a sample pack say of drums you know you'll have a quiet hit on the kick then you'll have a slightly louder one slightly louder one slightly louder one and the more dynamic layers you have in your sample pack the better the sample pack you can get more nuanced more realistic sounds you know if you just have four dynamic layers you go from quiet to a bit louder to <laughs> moderate to very loud there's not much resolution there it's similar with 16 bit to 24 bit jumping up to 32 bit floating if you can imagine more discrete layers of music that you could ever wish for that is what a 32 bit floating point basically does so let's get into some real world examples using ableton as our daw Right, to demonstrate the 32-bit floating point advantage when you're exporting files, I've got a little 303 track here, I'll quickly play it. Right, you can see everything's nicely gain staged. What I've got using utility plugins here, I've lowered the 
drums so that they're just going up to zero on a VU meter that is calibrated to minus 18 on the full digital scale, which means it will be minus 18 on this Ableton meter because that is the digital scale. So plenty of headroom in other words. Let's go to the 303, I've done the same here, I've lowered the output quite a bit so that it's peaking very conservatively and if we go to our master, open the VU meter here, you can see we're hitting zero there. Okay, so if I exported that, it would be perfectly gain staged and the mastering engineer would be very happy with me. But what's all this talk I hear about not having to worry about setting your levels or gain staging anymore once you've got your balance of your mix you can export it as loud as you want and you can clip as loud as you want as long as you're using a 32-bit floating point DAW. What does all that mean? Well okay we can boost the levels um, keeping the mix intact. Let's just whack on say 10 so what's that minus plus 8 dB there let's uh, also increase that so let's go at seven, let's press play. And we're going into the reds on the master. If we go into our master VU meter, you'll see we're going way over the levels that our gain stage version was doing. So what I've done is an exaggerated version of this. I've boosted the levels even more and they are horrendous. They come out sounding awful. If I just solo that, I'm going to lower this like crazy because it's so loud. And if you press play, that's the result. And what I've done, I exported that as a 24-bit file. And then I exported another example, same levels at 32-bit floating. Because the idea is that you should be able to send a clipped file like that to your mastering engineer with a little note saying yes I know it looks a bit crazy but you can just fix it by lowering the file because it's 32-bit floating well yes you are right if we lower that you'll see all the dynamics come back and if we play it sounds great okay now if we do that to the 24-bit file we try and rescue that and we lower the gain in exactly the same way you'll see no all the clipping is retained and if you play it it just still sounds horrendous okay so yes it's true 32-bit floating point you can rescue clipped tracks or tracks that have gone way into the reds post-production even with the waveform baked into audio files but is this a really good idea do you want to be sending that to a mastering engineer and when can you run into problems a lot of plugins are third party these days I've done a short video for Sonic Academy on why and when to reach for third-party plugins as opposed to stock plugins but many of them are modeled on vintage hardware that cannot cope with those kind of input gain levels that certainly the ones that I've used in this example you just say for a compressor you just can't find a threshold that's high enough to even begin to get any kind of meaningful gain reduction or, or even know what you're doing it will just sound absolutely awful but stop plugins especially with a DAW that is 32-bit floating like Ableton Live the stop plugins you should have the same theory all the processing it might even be be done internally at 64-bit these days so let's try and find out if that's the case Right, so I've put a stock Ableton compressor plug-in in this audio chain and I've reduced the levels back down to the perfectly gain stage levels as we can see on this VU meter. Just working with the 303 now. And okay, let's take off say 3 to 4 dB on those peaks. So let's uh, have a fast release and attack and let's start lowering the threshold until we start to average 
five or six, okay? And then let's bring the output up that amount, about six dB there, okay? And that sounds fairly good to me. Let's record that into a free channel so we can have a look at the waveform and compare it to one where we really boost the level. Okay, let's drop that down to there. Now let's go back and let's whack up the gain to an exaggerated level for this example. Now we're going to have to adjust the compressor quite a bit, I should imagine. Let's just take the output down. Okay, you can see there the gain reduction is too much. I just want to average out at around the same level that we had before, about six. And you can see I can't even do it. The, um, the threshold, I have to go positive 6 dB threshold. That's the highest the threshold goes. So we're reducing by a bit more. So that's one downside already of having such high gain going into it. And we have to then have our gain makeup. Now you can start to hear it get really crazy now, even though I've got the master level way down. I'm gonna have to also lower it in post-production so we don't damage any ears or speakers out there. There we go. And let's record that example. Okay, now we should theoretically be able to rescue that squared off waveform by simply lowering it because it's 32-bit float. So let's lower it. There you go. It does work. It is very impressive. You can see here they're virtually identical. If we play that one, it's no longer distorted. Sounds pretty much the same as the other one. All good. So yes, we can use stock plugins and we can still get around the gain staging problem by fixing things after, even after we've recorded them into audio files. It's, it's quite amazing. But the problem is, as I said, a lot of plugins are from third parties these days and a lot of them expect much lower input gain levels. And how are you going to know which ones are you going to have to look up in the manual? I've, I've looked in manuals and a lot of the plugin emulations for vintage gear, they don't say what the input gain is expected. I think they're just assuming the same as the hardware because they're modeled, you know, on the components of the hardware. So you need to know which device can cope with it and which can't. And you're not going to know that offhand. It's a lot of experimentation. And I think just think you're going to get lost. So my advice is, why not just learn how to properly gain stage? You saw how simple it was. You just stick a couple of VU meters or you go by the VU meters. If you use third party plugins and they're based on vintage ones, they'll have VU meters in most examples get into the habit of doing it your mastering engineer will love you because he'll have lots of headroom to work with still the problem is that there's a lot of confusion about what 32-bit floating recording is good for for example outside broadcast especially in one-off situations say you've got uh, an interview to do and it's a one-off interview you've only got one shot you're nervous and you're fiddling about with the recording levels on your recording device making sure that it's not clipping or making sure that the recording isn't so quiet that you have to raise the gain in post-production so much that you're lifting up all of the background noise and then you have to go through lots of post-production software to try and get rid of that, etc., etc. With 32-bit floating devices, you don't have to worry about that, but we have to differentiate between 32-bit floating recording devices, which there aren't many, and 32-bit floating DAWs like Ableton. We're talking about internal processing here, and that's what most people in music production will be concerned with. If you wanted to go 32-bit floating for recording everything, well, you'd need microphones that are 32-bit floating. Even if they came out with 32-bit audio interfaces, fantastic microphones that emulated vintage ones, 
I would still learn how to properly gain stage. It really will increase your skills as a music producer. And as I said, your mastering engineer will love you for it. Thank you.